We see the word organic now everywhere. We are educated on what it means. We try and eat organic, use organic skincare. And as gardeners, we often feed our soil and houseplants with organic products. Consuming organic products is now part of society's norm at this point. Most everyone knows what the word means, and at least when it comes to my household, prioritizes organic products where we can afford to. I was shocked to learn that there was a time when a product being organic would actually be a potential negative attribute. People potentially wouldn't market their products as being organic. And I learned about this from chatting with my friends at the Espoma Company, whose product has always been organic, but there was a time that they never marketed the fact that it was let alone put it at the front and center of their marketing like every brand on the market does now. For them, being an organic, earth-friendly brand wasn't a snazzy marketing term, but a lifestyle and vision for the company that's been passed down through four generations of leadership. And as an entrepreneur in the plant space and a consumer of plant products, I find it so inspiring. Today, we dive into an in-depth conversation I had with two of the four generations of this brand about what it's taken to build a massive organic gardening brand over the span of almost a century, why they've been successful at it, and why Espoma Organic has been organic before organic was cool. How many times do you think you're going to hear the word organic in today's episode, Plant Friends? Welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, the Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Hello, plant friends. Welcome to Growing Joy with Plants podcast. I'm Maria, your host. If you are new to the podcast, welcome. I'm so happy you're here. I'm your new plant friend, and I'm going to help you care for plants successfully and grow joy while doing so. And if you are a returning listener, welcome back, my plant friend. It means so much to me that you choose to join me on this weekly basis over and over again. And it's the greatest honor of my life to be a part of your journey in growing things and growing joy. I don't know if you're like me, but I am kind of a nerd about entrepreneurship and about learning more about the companies that make the products that I use, especially now that I've moved to the country. I've gotten more into supporting local brands, supporting Instead of just jumping to Amazon, I try and see if I could source it locally before I do that. It means a lot to me to know who I'm buying from and to support the people and companies I believe in. And I've gotten to know the family behind the Espoma company for the last four years because they have been a major support to this show. It's basically Espoma and their support is the reason why seven years later, I'm making this podcast for you for free for your consumption on a weekly basis. And yes, I also love their products. My plants are potted in their potting mix. My garden is fed with their garden soil and fertilizers. In general, I find that this company is impressive. And in this little mini series on the podcast of profiling plantrepreneurs and planty businesses, I thought it would be fun to dive into how they have made this four generation company successful. As an entrepreneur, I'm super inspired by how they've grown their business. But as a consumer and just as a human, I'm so blown away by how relentless they are to sticking to their values. Yes, they're a family company, but they also, I feel like, have treated me like family in our relationship. If you've been a longtime listener, you will know that last year I almost lost my mind and went on this crazy adventure to fly my lime tree, Limey, to Florida. He wasn't doing well in our dark home in upstate New York, and I was beside myself about it. I had like a full mentee B, a full mental breakdown about it. And I was on a planning call with Jamie, who you're going to meet today about just like planning our ads because she's one of our sponsors. And I was telling Jamie about how upset I was about Limey not doing well and how I had this crazy idea to potentially bring him to Florida. Jamie, without a second of a thought, was like, how much does a flight cost? Send me the bill. Send me the invoice. Get Limey to Florida. We can't give up on him. This was my sponsor. Are you kidding? Like, I don't know. They're amazing. They're amazing people. They're running an amazing company. Their product is amazing. Like I've said, my whole collection is planted in it. I guess what I'm saying is there's so much more to this company than soil or fertilizer or their famous tones. And I'm excited to introduce you to this family and share the impressive story of how they've grown this very famous plant brand. So get ready. The multi-generational team of the Espoma Company, I am so excited to welcome you all today to Growing Joy, finally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So 
Before we dive in, I don't know if this is one of the first times that multi-generations of the Espelma Company have been on some sort of media platform. So I'd love for all of you to introduce yourselves and your involvement with the company when you've been working with the company. And of course, we have to start with Serge, the king of Espoma. Well, thank you. Yes, I'm Serge Bruner. I am now the uh, chairman of the board, which tells you where I am in and what point I am in, in my working life. I started at Espoma in 1977, so I got a, a lengthy tenure. And in 1970, I turned over the reins to my son after he uh, proved himself worthy. And so I'm in the enviable position of being able to uh, stay connected and see the progress as uh, the next generations of Jeremy and Jamie uh, take hold and be the company into the future. I love that. What about you, Jeremy? Yeah, so I'm the fourth generation. I joined the, the company in 1997. So my dad and I were 20 years apart. So yeah, I've been here for 26 years. A few years ago, we made a transition where I became the president. My dad's the uh, CEO, chairman of the board. And um you know, it's been a fun ride. I guess we should be calling you the king of Espoma then. No, Who no, gets to, I don't know, no. with this with this multi-generational. <laughs> when it's your dad, it's still the king. Like, you know. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Abs- That's fair. Absolutely. <laughs> and what about you, Jamie? Well, I'm Jamie Bruner. I'm Jeremy's sister and Serge is my father. I do not have the long length at Espoma that they do. I think I just celebrated my eight-year anniversary, which sounds funny to me because it just doesn't feel like it's been that long but at the same time I guess that that is starting to age me a little bit but yeah no so I work in our marketing department and I manage our digital marketing side yeah you're part of I I'll always remember Jamie one of our first meetings you were like you know we can't make soil sexy I think you said like sexy or cool like we've got to figure out you know, how do we make soil appealing? That's how we work with content creators. And I've just loved you ever since. I think I used the example my dad always says that we're the shoe polish to the shoe. Like the shoe is sexy, but like the shoe polish, not so much. (laughs) Exactly. But very necessary. Very necessary. Okay. So four generations. I mean, that's a very impressive thing. I don't think a lot of people have those bragging rights. So Serge, can you walk us through what the four generations looked like? You guys have been in business. Your family's been involved for 95 years. What have the generations looked like? That is uh, a fascinating thing to look back on. Certainly the founder, Herb Sanders, he was the true entrepreneur. In every generation after that, the challenge has been not so much entrepreneurial as managerial. And there's a lot of people who can start things but there aren't that many people who can start and manage things. You've heard of serial entrepreneurs. They go flitting from one thing to another. So when Herb Sanders started the company, it was with the prime motivation to be his own boss. He wanted to be in charge of his life. And with a farming background in his family, he saw the transitions that were happening in agriculture, which was in the 20s was when chemical fertilizers were coming to the fore and organic fertilizers were being phased out because for production agriculture, there are many advantages in chemicals, the primary being, or two primary advantages, higher nutrient values and a lot less weight. You need a lot less material. So they were taking over, but Herb Sanders realized that for the inexperienced gardener and homeowner, they didn't have the expertise that would allow them to be successful and not burn their plants. So he saw an opportunity that organics were safer, they were tried and true, he was familiar with them, and he wanted to provide them to the uh, gardener. So he started the company and he started it in South Jersey because everything he needed was here. We had Vineland was the center of the egg producing industry for the Northeast. You had meat packing in Philadelphia. 
We had a crab industry in the Delaware Bay. He had all the ingredients he thought to make a superior product. The only trouble is he didn't have a market because truly the lawn and garden market didn't really uh, develop till after World War II when the GIs came back and uh, started suburbia and everything busted loose. So it was a struggle for him, but it was a means to be his own boss, to create something and have that really tremendous satisfaction of inventing something. So he started his SPOMA, and then in 1949, he had the inspiration of creating a brand. Not many companies have a holly tone. Coca-Cola has their Coke, the cereals like Cheerios and General Mills, they have a brand. We have a brand. And in our industry, we're one of the key brands. There are brands that are known and it can bring a demand to your uh, garden center. And we have that luxury thanks to his genius. After Herb, who was the uh, founder, we got lucky that his son, who went to school to be a, a geologist and had the realization that if he was ever going to be in control of his own life, he had better prospects of going back and working for his dad than for working in a uh, Fortune 500 company. So he made that decision. And Dean, to me, was the linchpin of four generations. He had the realization that he and his father had worked long and hard. To what purpose? To what end? And he had no children. And so after putting 25 years in, he asked his dad, what are we going to do? It's not my aspiration to die at the helm. And at that point, I had married Herb's uh, granddaughter, and I was finishing graduate school with a different direction in mind. And they came to me and, and asked if I would be willing to try being in the fertilizer business instead of the uh, academic science business. And I said, my wife wanted to be back in South Jersey where she was from. So I said, I'll try it. And after been trying it for over 40 some years, it's, it's been working out. So anyway, uh, I got involved in the business. But Dean, what I always said was Herb was an entrepreneur and he did everything by the seat of his pants because he was discovering how to do things and what to do. Dean was the first one to say, let's get systematic about things. There's got to be a way to run a company and grow a company beyond intuition. And so he started record keeping, data collecting, and this kind of thing. When I came in with my science background, I continued that. In addition, I automated the plant and then also computerized the office side of things. And so we're building on the shoulders of the people ahead of us. And it's really when Dean and I were running the company that we've appreciated the family aspect of things that we've been blessed to have the satisfaction of creating a product that helps people beautify their environment and gives us the satisfaction of being successful and watching the company grow and, and reaping the benefits, not only for our consumers, but for our employees and for our families. So it was gratifying to me when uh, Jeremy came to me as a junior in college and said, hey, I, I think I'd like to come back and join the company. But one of the guiding principles that we, Dean and I, early on ascribed to was that you had to earn it. There's no entitlement. And he's my son. And when he came to me and said he wanted to come in, I pretty much told him the same thing that Dean told me when I came from academia into the company. He said, hey, look, there's an opportunity here. But if you don't have the talent and you don't have the passion, you'll have a job, but it'll never be my job because we have a responsibility to the company, to the products, to our employees, to our consumers, to be the best we can be. And we need talented people. So are there secrets to our success? I think one of the secrets 
is that uh, we work hard and we're good at what we do. And you got to prove yourself. So after 20 some years, Jeremy had proved himself. It was his turn. Jamie's in the fold now, and it's her turn to prove herself and, and, and see what her contributions to the company can be. I love that. Yeah, Jeremy, I'm curious, as a junior, having that conversation with your dad, what do those first 10 years look like after graduating and I'm assuming working your way up in the company? What did that look like? Not probably how we planned it. <laughs> My dad kind of kept me away from the business growing up because he had seen so many family businesses where, you know, they had the kid sweeping the floor since he was five. And by the time they grew up, they were kind of burned out, you know, and didn't want to come back. So I, I was pretty much kept away from the business. When I got to college, I got involved in what was pretty new at the time, which was entrepreneurship programs that were starting to develop within the business schools. So now I start to get curious about the business and that's kind of how that whole thing started. So after that, I went to law school, but then after that, I, I did come back into the business and, um, you know, started in sales, started in the plant. The whole training side of it kind of got cut short because my dad had a bout with cancer. You know, at that time, he was really doing everything in terms of running the business day to day. And so really the only option was to kind of yank me out and uh, learn the basics of what I needed to do just to kind of keep things going during his treatments. And then once he came back, and, and obviously he's been fine, a lot of things he was doing, he was like, you know what, you can <laughs> you can keep doing this. I think I got to uh, enjoy myself a little more. Yeah, because he was working, putting a lot of hours in, working pretty hard. So that kind of sped up the transition to some degree. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's not easy coming back to a family business. I can't speak for all family business, obviously, but when you come back and you're 25 years old and most of the people that you're working with are, you know, have known you since you were a little kid and they're a lot older than you. And that's not easy, an easy thing. But I was excited at the opportunity to take a strong regional brand and trying to grow it to the next level, to make it national, to expand the product line. To me, the, the interesting thing was being able to try to take it from here and take it to that next level. So we've always been kind of a continuous improvement. How are we going to how are we going to grow? How are we going to improve? That had appeal to me. So yeah, I think there's something very special with family businesses. I don't know if my listeners know this at all, but my dad had a business. My sister works for him full time and he launched a podcast in the pandemic. So I helped him develop and launch his podcast. And it ended up just being something I did on the side as like a reason to connect with him on a weekly basis. But what I've noticed with family businesses is no one fights harder for your business than your family. Like my sister and I, you guys, because of your dad's history, because of this lineage, you fight a little bit harder for it than you would, you know, a company that you don't have loyalty to in that way. But I would also assume there's a lot of difficulties that come along with the fact that, you know, you're at Thanksgiving dinner one day and then the next day there's like shit hitting the fan at, at the office and, you know, navigating the work relationship and the... Can I ask, what do you guys call Serge at work? Do you call him dad or do you call him Serge? Dad. You do? Yeah. My dad makes me call him by his first name <laughs> when we're in a meeting. I have to call him John at one point and then I'm allowed to call him dad, you know, when we're not on a Zoom call. You only call your parent by their first name when they're in trouble or you're trying to get their attention in a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> to me, one of the uh, good things about our company is the size. I've always said we're a very capital intensive company, but not a people intensive company. So what happens is when you're in a small company and you only have a handful of people around, formality isn't an issue. So it never came that, hey, I'm hiring you, Jeremy, in the company, I want you to refer to me as Mr. Bruner or <laughs> whatever, but it's generational. For instance, Obviously, a lot of my uh, peers, uh, their parents have passed away now. But when I was growing up, I would never refer to someone by their first name. Just wouldn't do it. And we wouldn't either. Like, I would have called your friends Mr. Whoever. So it's part of that, the cultural differences and changes and things. We're not in suits and ties, so we don't have to get that, you know, formal. But maybe in some settings... 
we probably should maybe like at a conference or something, I shouldn't be like, and here's my dad. Like, No, I think it's charming. And I think being a 95 year old family business is part of your brand. So I think that's part of the shtick. So along the lines of family brand, along the lines of, you know, this is this being a family business, how has the family business kind of bled into your company culture? I know you have employees that also feel like family. What has that looked like? In the beginning, in a small company, the admin side of things really didn't exist. There was my uncle, myself, and a secretary. So you're running a plan. And what I like to say about business, the business of business, is that there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. What was instituted from the get-go with Espoma was we care about how, not just what the results are. So we run a tight organization. In the plant, we insist on a place for everything, everything in its place. The, the work environment is kept neat clean, organized. We run a tight ship and we believe in reinvesting in our corporation. So strict maintenance schedules on the equipment and a length of a life for each equipment. And then we replace it. Now, what's that? what that does is you never have an old plant. There was two philosophies with fertilizer plants when they first started proliferating. One was use it, abuse it, and then replace it. And the other was take care of it, maintain it, and it never gets old. Well, the consequence of choosing to maintain our plant meant that you had to have pride in things. You had to instill your employees with a sense of pride in the mission that we were trying to do. If you use it, abuse it, and then replace it, no one cares. And the culture gets a lot tougher to say, wait a minute, we're trying to make the very best product. So we care about the end product, but we don't care about anything else. It's easier that we care about everything all along the way. And so that was the culture that was started in the plant and then passed on to the admin once we started growing of, wait a minute, I like to paraphrase an old army saying, which is there's a right way, a wrong way, and the Espoma way. And it was my responsibility to pass that on to Jeremy. And now it's Jeremy's responsibility to pass it on to his uh, contemporaries in the future. Plant friends, if you want to be successful with houseplants, you have to have two things. Number one, the knowledge to care for them successfully, which we give you here for free on the podcast. And number two, healthy plants. You do not want to set yourself up for failure by bringing home a poorly grown plant or a plant suffering from pests or a plant that is not going to transition indoors well in your home. That's why I am so excited to introduce you to my new favorite houseplant grower, Proven Winners Leaf Joy, my new plant friends. If you haven't heard of them already, Proven Winners Leaf Joy is setting the standard for houseplant cultivation. I just got back from visiting their greenhouses in Virginia and plant friends. I was so blown away. They are selecting only the best plant genetics, cultivating them in the state-of-the-art fancy European greenhouse. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll see the reels of me in my pink jumpsuit frolicking in the greenhouse that is filled with Monstera Thai constellation, philodendron, alocasia, pink plants, green plants, variegated plants. If you have a plant on your wish list, I am sure Proven Winners Leaf Joy either already has the plant in its collection or is probably growing it out and bringing it to market soon. And I so appreciate that they really want to set their consumers up for success. They have plant tags. Their plant tags not just have some care instructions, but they also have real plant Latin, the scientific names of the plants, in addition to whatever name the market gives them, so that we can set ourselves up for success by actually understanding what plants we are taking care of. And if you struggle with picking the right plants for your home, they have a line of different collections based on different home and room types that you can kind of mix and match. So next time you're at your favorite garden center, look for the Proven Winners Leaf Joy plant tags. You will not be disappointed in the variety and quality of houseplants that they have. Find plant joy in leaf joy. Dare I say grow joy with leaf joy. Head to provenwinners.com to find your local Leaf Joy dealer and let me know which plant you take home on socials. Yeah, 
Jamie has mentioned to me before your philosophy on being keepers of the company instead of the CEO or the big boss. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, I'm going to see how good a job I did. I'll let Jeremy speak to that. Yeah, Jeremy. What? Yeah, why don't you tell us what keepers of the company means to you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a stewardship model that my dad and Dean always preached, which is each of us gets an opportunity to um, to lead the company, and our responsibility is to make it better, so that you know by the end of our tenure, it's a bigger, better company than it was when we started. And if if we keep doing that for each generation and and that's really the goal. I mean, I think a lot of other businesses, even a lot of contemporaries that I went to school with, their goal has always been, oh, I'd love to start a company and sell it. I'd love to start a company and sell it. Exit. Yeah. Exit plan. Yeah. yeah. And cash out and cash out. And my dad has re you know, everybody through the four generations has hoped that it can get to the next generation. So I think that stewardship model is, you know, I want to make it bigger, better. So that my, so the next generation of, of in the family that runs it has those op- same opportunities. So that's a different mindset. You think you do things for the long term, not for the short term gains. You try to do things right. You try to have a good team, a good culture. The average length of service here is over 14 years, but we've had, we probably have at least a handful of people right now who have been here over 30 or 40 years which is unheard of in these days. Yeah, it's very unique. And we have multi-generations of people who, who have worked for us and then their kids have worked for us. So, I mean, you just, you know, that gives you a little bit of that sense. Like we really take a lot of pride yeah. in like, the service. We have a lot of, um, you know, we plaques, we give awards, we give bonuses every five years, 10 years, 20, 30, you know. So we take a lot of pride in that. And I think employee retention in this day and age is like so unheard of with how the younger generations just jump from company to company. And I do think that speaks a lot. I've heard a story about the Bank of Espoma. Can we hear about what the Bank of Espoma is? Because another unheard of thing that you guys do in that kind of family that thought of a family business being more than just the nuclear family of you three, but actually the whole company being a family. You have to go back to uh, the early days when employees were paid in cash at the end of the week. The thing that happens with uh, guys that are living from paycheck to paycheck is that things happen. The car breaks down. They want to move from one apartment to another. They want to buy their first home. They need help. And so early on, we would make loans to long-term employees, obviously not a, a new hire, but Anyone who'd been working here, if anything came to that, they get a a no interest loan to help them get the new car they need or the replacement car, the apartment or help a home. But you see it all. You have employees that are with you 10, 20, 30, 40 years. There's a relationship that transcends the work workplace. Yeah. Uh, they need help. We're loyal to them. They're loyal to us. And it's a two-way street. You know, my dad's seen our team have kids, their kids now having kids. We have an employee. I used to lifeguard his kids at, at a pool when I was a teenager. So there's this kind of passing. I mean, John, who works with me and is our VP of marketing, he's been with the company as long as I've been alive. So you there's these generations that cross over and your employees, you know them so long. How can you not? care about them and become invested. Yeah, I think two things from that story that very, (laughs) that story Serge just told. But I think too, that speaks to this concept of like running a business as if it's a family business, whether or not it's your family business. I was saying it just speaks to your ability to retain your employees. Because if you are able to treat someone like a team member and not just a number that they're punching in and punching out, it's going to encourage them to stay and maybe even have this generational experience where their kids actually want to come work where their parent works. I mean, that's an incredibly unique thing. And I think it's the culture that speaks to that. I do want to get into a little bit more of the history of the company from a product standpoint, Hollytone. So what's the history with Hollytone? Why did it become such a standout product for you guys? Kind of a pillar of of your product suite. So tell me more about the creation of this important product for you. 
Herb Sanders started the company, he chose to go into the lawn and garden segment that for him, his customers were estates and gardeners of estates because suburbia didn't exist yet. And the company was growing very slowly. It was doing well enough to provide uh, a decent income for him and his family, but not much more. And in 46, the plant burned down. And that's a story we can get into. Amazing how we were still here. But he really considered giving it up. But after the war was over and the GIs came back, the impetus for suburbia was the GI Bill. The government gave loans to the returning soldiers so they could buy homes. And all of a sudden, the Levitt towns, you know, the, the mass production of uh, homes in a row stamped like cookie cutters was done. But part of the requirements to get a GI back mortgage was you had to have a lawn and you had to have four shrubs or the, you couldn't get your mortgage. Well, all of a sudden, people who were from the cities had no idea of, OK, great. How do you do? What do you take care of? How do you do it? What do these plants need? And so nurserymen, who were our previous customers, all of a sudden started developing garden centers for these homeowners. So give them the knowledge. And we were the products they were using, so they recommended it to these homeowners. Now, at the same time, the Holly Society of America, it started here in Millville, and the charter members of the Holly Society our grandfather was one of them, and he recognized the need for a class of product that didn't exist, acid-loving plants. And he got together with the first holly orchard in America with the manager, and they developed, working together, doing experimental uh, plots of creating the first acid-loving plant food. Herb had a habit. He kept a pad by his bed stand. And if he had a great idea, he would jot it down so he wouldn't forget it in the morning. And one night, the story goes, he had this idea, he wrote a name down. In the morning, he turned to his wife and he asked her, what do you think about the name Holly Tone for Hollies? He said, I like it. And that started our best known product. Now, so it sounds like Holly Tone was a response to a need, an emerging need that was coming out. And it's very interesting. I did an interview with a historian on the history of war gardens and victory gardens. And that is not something people talk about, the effects of war on home gardeners. But it is, I mean, the home garden category really did emerge from these wars and these these victory gardens and exactly what you shared. And it led to our second product. We started with one product. The Spoma Organic was for everything. When the uh, Victory Gardens came about, we came out with our garden food. And so we were a two-product company until we became a three-product company with Hollytone. And it sounds like you look to the market for what their pain points are, and then you develop something to fix it. Like is the, and maybe Jeremy, this question is for you, but as the line of tones has developed. And it's funny, Holly tone is the only tone I don't use, right? Because I don't have Holly on my property, but I've probably used all your other tones at this point and in my garden. How do you evaluate in product development? Like what's the next product to develop? Is it we've gotten this many requests from our, you know, from our consumers. So we're going to go about developing this. Like, what does that look like? I think that our business has always been very hands-on, right? We're also hands-on with our sales team. So we have a, a team of people who their pretty much sole focus is visiting the top few thousands of garden centers, of independent garden centers throughout the country, calling on them, educating them, helping them with their promotions, their merchandising, their ordering, their fertilizer education. And so as managing the, them and, and reading their, their call reports and meetings with them, they'll tell you, oh, this is what we're seeing, or this is on the rise, or this seems to be trending, or this customers are asking us for this, or, oh, we've seen a new a new product from someone else or, or something. And so that has kind of helped us kind of stay on the pulse. You know, before the internet, it really was hard to have any kind of real relationship with the consumer. It was just 
you know, maybe you'd get phone calls here and there. The backbone for us was developing relationships with the best garden centers. And if those garden centers stocked your products and recommended your products to consumers, you know, you would kind of win out. So it was really convincing them to do that. And so that kind of kept us on the pulse of what was going on. I mean, we've been trying, we've tried to be careful, walk the line of like, we don't just jump onto every little fad that kind of comes and goes. I mean, we, we want it to be, you know, have good agronomic value. You know, we want to try to, to make either our products better or add new products that help solve problems. And they also have enough volume that you can justify the product. You know, you've got to buy, if you want to add a four pound tone or a four pound product, you know, you may have to buy 25, 30,000 bags. If you're only going to sell 500, is it worth the investment? So there is an economic thing, but if you think, you know, again, as a long-term company, if you think, well, it might start out slow, but eventually it could be there, we, we can do it. And we certainly, you know, my dad always used to say to, to me early on, like if an accountant ran our business solely just by the numbers, you'd probably get rid of 80% of the products that we sell because there's a lot of, after Holly Tone and a handful of others, there's a lot of small volume products, but we want to fill out that shelf and we want to be able to provide our retailers and our consumers with everything they need. And it, whether it's a tone or whether it's bone meal or, you know, rock phosphate or kelp meal or what, whatever that is, if they're making their own recipes or just need nutritional supplements, we probably create a 60, 70 skew just in my time. And we've added a whole line of potting soils, garden soils, liquid plant foods, organic lawn programs. We had control products at one time. You know, some things stick, some things just don't sell enough to justify. So we've tried a lot of things. They kind of come in waves and then you kind of reach a plateau for a little bit. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah. Shout out to Liquid Plant Food. It's right behind me on my shoulder. I freaking yeah, endure. I love, I love it. I love, I love that. It. I love that product. That was my introductory Espoma product. What were you going to say, Jamie? I was going to say, I challenge you that you didn't use Holly Tone because I'm, I think one thing that your, you know, your listeners probably may or may not realize, and I think is one of the things that sometimes we're hesitant to jump on these trends that Jeremy was talking about. It's like our products serve a lot of purposes. So, you know, today's consumer, they, they're very used to like, oh, well, it says succulent on it. It has to say Monstera plant on it. It has to say like, just because it's holly tone doesn't mean that it's just for hollies. It's for your berries. It's for your hydrangeas. It's, you know, it, there's a lot of different acid loving plants. And, and I'm assuming that's probably why we made our plant food finder on our website because of all these things of like, well, what do I put this on? What do I put that on? But different areas, different types of consumers, we've had to kind of pivot and make, you know, different types of products because, well, maybe I don't, I want to know that it's, I want to, we have evergreen tone, you know, we have berry tone. But do you need to have hydrangea tone? Like at a certain point, you need to to trust and, and kind of look at what what's the product for and not just what's the name. Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, at least my experience, you know, I learned about you guys with the indoor liquid because I was living in 500 square feet only with houseplants. And then as I've grown and I only have grow bags right now, so I'm not gardening in ground yet because I'm still renting. So then I'm using the garden tone and the tomato tone and the citrus tone, but I'm like, I'm growing with you guys because as my, you know, literal land increases, you know, as my capacity to garden increases, it's nice that you do have that I can just stay with one company, but move through the, the rainbow of all your products. Since we're on that topic, Jeremy, I know that there's, you know, been the big announcement of your new facility, the new Espoma facility that you're building out that's going to really change how you guys are able to put together and develop develop products, right? Because right now or pre pre facility, you have to find all the different products, source them, it's like a whole thing to even be able to assemble and bring stuff to market. So why as one of your big things in your tenure of the steward of the company was developing this facility so important? Well, some of it just, <laughs> you know, was by circumstance, but um, we've been dependent upon suppliers in the past for certain key ingredients. And so, and then we would take those bulk ingredients and, and we would screen blend and bag them and accordingly. But we've had a few companies over the last, say, handful of years who have either elected to get out of the business or, or gone out of business. 
you know, during COVID, when demand for gardening products peaked, one of our suppliers burned to the ground. And so some of it is, isn't so much that like, you know, there's part of it that, yeah, I want to be able to do it myself and do it better. And then part of it was like, if we don't do this ourselves, <laughs> you know, we, we may have a problem, you know, sourcing in the, in the future and be able to keep up. So we, we have always kind of had it as a pain point. You're never in a good place to be relying on one or two, two suppliers. And also as these companies were going out of business, we were having to get things from further and further away. And the cost of freight and all those things, obviously, if you can keep things closer, it's, it's better. So for a variety of reasons, we said, you know what, maybe it's time to kind of return to our roots because originally, like my dad said, when, when our neighboring town was a big poultry area, we did process and, and dry things ourselves and process things ourselves. As that industry went away, we relied on others to do it. So we started looking into it in uh, Pennsylvania, which obviously is not far from, from, where we, from where we are in New Jersey. You know, we found a place that's near a lot of uh, egg producing areas, nearby a lot of raw materials that we can use. And by doing this ourselves, one, we can cut down on the freight and the logistics. We can increase the capacity for growth. We can obviously save costs. But the big thing was that one of our other pain points was that no one was really making organic ingredients into little prills that you'd see like in a synthetic fertilizer. So if you've ever used synthetics, you know, you can put them through a spreader and they all look like little round balls and they spread nicely and they're not too dusty. And um, whereas the organics weren't really built that way and they tended to be kind of dusty and, and not great in spreaders. So what we're doing with this new facility is, you know, we're taking the best of both worlds and we're taking the, these great organic ingredients, but we're going to process them more like how you would make a, a synthetic fertilizer. I mean, it's still going to be sustainable and natural and organic. There's nothing to that, but just making it physically a better product with less dust and more uniformity, more durability, and it'll really help us expand, you know, possibly into other markets uh, as well, because now we can start selling the excess into commercial markets, into agricultural markets, into golf course. If you have a golf course that wants to be more organic and, and use less chemicals and pesticides, now all of a sudden we can make greens grades and standard grades and, and we can control things that we never were able to control before. And so hopefully our consumers will appreciate that it's just a much easier to use, better to use, especially if they're going to use it on lawns or anything with spreaders. And so it's a huge project. It's the biggest project we've ever done. It's been years in the making. And also there's an environmental benefit to the state of Pennsylvania by not having these raw materials land applied that, that could leach into the Chesapeake Bay. We're now taking those ingredients and drying them, processing them, removing all the pathogens and you know bringing them here, turning them into a great organic fertilizer that's then you know, distributed throughout the country. So the state of Pennsylvania recognized that there was environmental benefits to that, and they were excited to um, to have us open this facility. So we're hoping that by the end of this year, cross our fingers, that uh, it will be up and running and we will be able to supply ourselves with the bulk ingredients, the main ingredients that we use for blending here. I love that return to the original mission of the company of, okay, let's look around and, and keep it local. Personally, I'm excited to hear that because I actually, I love your tones. And for me, I mean, for me, it wasn't a big deal, but I keep a little rubber glove in the tomato tone and in the citrus tone because of that dust. And it, for me, it was, you know, just a little, just part of using an organic product that I didn't mind that much, but I'm excited to think about the fact that it might just be a little, little easier on my manicure. <laughs> Okay, you mentioned sustainability. This is one of my favorite things about you guys. Why one of my favorite things of why I love working with you. It's such a big part of your brand ethos, your mission. You know, I think integrity is a huge through line of this entire conversation. But Jamie's mentioned to me before, like, you guys were organic before organic was cool. I've heard that it was actually something that you tried not to tell 
the consumer because people were scared of of being organic. So what has this journey for you looked like going from having organic not necessarily be like the front line of your your marketing to now being why people are going to choose the Espoma bag over another company's bag because people like, you know, voting in with their dollars these days. I think I probably caught that transition in my tenure because in the beginning before it really got popular our packaging would say like Espoma Holly Tone, Espoma Rose Tone. It didn't say Espoma Organic. And again, I'm really talking pre-internet because it's kind of like a different world back then when, again, when we're relying really on communication with retail. If we went into a new retailer and said, we've got an organic line, they might just like close the door on our face because they're like, oh, organic products, they don't work. They don't sell. That's so they're wild. Too expensive. Yeah. You know, it was a negative and so the education on our side, you know, part of what helped us back then was that we were branded. You know, we weren't out there saying, I want to sell you an organic. You know, we were saying, we want to sell you Holly Tone. We want to sell you Rose Tone. And the reason that we think you should do that is that it's the best thing for your garden. And here's why, you know, because it uses a lot of these organic ingredients. And that, so you were selling a brand and that kind of helped. Then what happened, and I don't remember exactly, you know, when, but pretty early on, when organics all of a sudden you know, got hot and became a big trend and competitors started coming out of the woodworks and they were shouting out, you know, whatever their name was. If, if it was Joe, it was Joe's Organic. If it was Pete, it was Pete's Organic. You know, it was, it was, they were shouting Organic. And then the same retailers who didn't want us kind of downplaying Organics were like, you guys aren't really communicating Organic loud enough, you know, on your packaging. And um, so we kind of, again, really returned to the original branding from 1929, which was the Spoma Organic. And, you know, we had to reformulate some mixes that weren't completely 100% and make kind of, you know, go all in on the organic and and certifications and and everything else. And so it was kind of interesting to see how that whole thing kind of played out just in my span of like downplaying it in the beginning and then going, oh my God, we've got to shout it out as loud as we can as, as things kind of shifted and and changed. So that was definitely interesting. And when you say we were organic before there was organic, it and sustainability and recycling, our ingredients, we didn't think of it as recycling. They hadn't invented the term. They were our ingredients. Byproducts were what we needed. The byproducts from the meat packing industry, the bone meals, the meat meals, the byproducts from farming. So cottonseed meal and castor bean meal, and these were byproducts. We were recycling because that's how nature does it. You know, the leaves fall in the forest, they get recycled to feed the trees. We were doing it. And then as a recognition of being efficient and environmentally conscious, this is what we've been doing since 1929. We just needed to get our story out and get it told again. The markup of all the house plant and Maria's listeners will appreciate it's like you can go online, you can see these new products that come out and they have these really high price points and people are like, okay, well, I guess that goes with my really expensive house plant collection since plant prices have also gone up. But if they, they would just look at what they're actually using, they could save a lot of money and use that towards their plants if they would just go with our indoor. And then to kind of go on the things we were talking about with, you know, we've always been sustainable. And I remember going to my dad because I was filling out, I think it was something, it was like a sustainability certification or something. And I'm like, so how long have we been zero waste, you know, manufacturing? He was like, since always. And I'm like, oh, okay. So all these years, whereas, you know, a lot of times you hear companies, they just, they institute these things, right? Like, oh, this is something I need to do now because I need to care about the environment. And maybe we didn't do it because H.G. Sanders wasn't like a tree hugger, maybe, but we did things a certain way and we and we did it. You know, we talked about how to keep the facility and run a tight ship. I mean, these were just things that we've always done the right way naturally, I guess. Right. Being ahead of the curve again. It's very interesting. You mentioned certifications. I wanted to ask quickly, How as a consumer, like, it feels like there's a lot of different certifications. I don't know which one to pay attention to. Greenwashing is a whole thing now that everybody's talking about as well. So like you said, we've been organic since the 20s, right? 
but now you have to get this label on a bag in order for everyone to celebrate you and say, okay, we're organic across multiple different industries, right? That this struggle is is happening. So when you guys approach getting certified for these things, when it's something you've done for so long, like how do you approach that? And what are you placing value on? With fertilizer, it's a state regulated industry. So you're forced to do a lot of things. But what's happened over time, there's there's various ways to certify your product. For us, what as we transitioned from a regional to a national company and went out west, California, which is obviously one of the largest states, if you want to market your products as organic in, in their state, you have to you know undergo a, a certification. And so because we wanted to be nationally distributed and we obviously wanted to be able to market our products as organic. And so we decided that the California's uh, department, so CDFA is kind of what they call it, that we would, you know, use their organization uh, as a as our organic certifying organization. So you have to supply a lot of information, a lot of information that we prefer not to supply, but you know, you have to to do it and you pay fees and, and whatnot. But for us, in order to do what we wanted to do and, and to give that third party credibility that, you know, probably gives people some peace of mind, we have the CDFA, the California's organic certification, basically, on uh, any of our organic fertilizer products. Right. I remember on a state level, sometimes when I look at your packaging, it says in this state, if you look at the ingredients, this is what's in, you know, in this state. But if you're in these states, it's a different ingredient. So I'm assuming that's part of that struggle. It sounds difficult. (laughs) It's definitely one of the challenges of being in a state regulated. Is that if If one state says, you know, we'd like you to label it, this way. And you don't want to start creating different labels for different states. So now all of a sudden you're saying, okay, well, here's the label. But if you're in XYZ state, it's dot an I and cross a T here. So that's kind of made it one of the one of the challenges. But from a certification standpoint, you know, everybody acknowledges that California is, is one of the big ones. And, uh, and so that's kind of worked for for us, but there are others, but that's, that's the one that we chose to do because we wanted to distribute and sell in California. And so it just made sense. So years ago, when we first started working together and I was putting together ad copy, you know, I was really surprised that you guys had a solar powered facility and you had sustainability commitments before this massive sustainability commitment frenzy has been happening in the last couple of years of everybody, you know, going carbon neutral, which I love, but you were doing this before that. Why is it so important to you? Well, it gets back to the our basic nature. When you have a long-term viewpoint, you do the right thing. We do the right thing and we're future focused, right? So you're going to do things so that it's it's good for the planet and all those things, but it's also just ensuring we have the best technology, the best products, the best of everything that we can do for what, you know, not only for now, but for that next generation to come. Yeah, no, totally. And I think something that I'm hearing a lot throughout this whole conversation is this I am the horizon, this through line of long term vision. And it speaks to so many different facets. It speaks to the family. If this is a generational business, like thinking of this business being having maybe future generations running it, it speaks to the planet. I mean, I don't want to say it's ironic, but the irony that you're a, you know, organic soil company and you're also so rooted into doing what's right for the planet. I think that's very interesting, but that's also how so many people are approaching global warming and and giving back to the planet all of a sudden we're thinking about the earth that our kids have to grow up on and then also for the business for the longevity of the business i just think it's i think it's very interesting so with that speaking to this through line i'd love to ask a closing question to all of you so serge what is your proudest moment running a spoma in all of your decades at the company do you have one? Is that an is that a fair question to ask? It might be an unfair question to ask. No, it's a fair question to ask. And one of the things that there's a lot of satisfaction. I've had a lot of satisfaction in my life. And one of the satisfying things now in my current role is I've become the historian and the storyteller. <laughs> Case in point with this podcast. <laughs> yeah. And so 
when you ask, is there a crowning moment, uh, uh, an achievement that uh, was the pinnacle of, of, say, my career, there are many along the way. But the crowning moment is right now, being able to look back and have the satisfaction of saying, look, when it was my turn to be the caretaker, I was successful. I took it from uh, a point and I brought it to a much more successful point. And I was able to successfully turn it over to someone I have the confidence can take it and do the same thing that I did that's worthy to this as a successor to the generations before me. So do I have a, a, a crowning moment? The crowning moment is that I, I get to have that satisfaction of looking backwards and forwards with a great deal of confidence and really uh, joy. We're doing a good job and I met my responsibility to the company and I get to look over the shoulders of, of my uh, successors and, and, and watch them grapple with the same uh, challenges and different ones and new ones that I had. And I've preached this to both my children. I think everyone has to be somewhere doing something. And when you're doing something that's worthy and that is successful, then you had a, a very worthwhile, satisfying life. And, and I've been uh, lucky to be able to say that. So I think I had, a, I hope I didn't set too high a bar for Jeremy and <laughs> Jamie. Um, how do you? follow that up. I don't know. I know. I just want to say to be able to say I look back on my life and I've had a lot of satisfaction. May we all be so lucky to be able to say that when we get to your age. That's really beautiful. Jeremy, so I'm curious now, what's your dream for your tenure, your future tenure at the company when you're sitting in your dad's chair in a few decades looking back? What are you hoping that you'll be able to recall and brag about your time? spent in leadership of the company? Well, I'm hoping that my time is freed up so that I can be the historian and not yeah. have to deal with all the the day-to-day -day stresses of, of business and that, you know, maybe my kids are uh, on the call with us and uh, passing it on to the next uh, generation. And, um, you know, look, I'm, I'm very, I'm very proud. I mean, we always say that if my great grandfather was here, he would never believe the one little building with one little product you couldn't even fathom what we're building out in Pennsylvania. You couldn't fathom the size and scale that we are today compared to 95 years ago. So we take a lot of pride in that. You know, we take a lot of pride. For me, I've really enjoyed, you know, seeing the growth and development. I enjoy making new products because I enjoy seeing something go from concept to then on a shelf or see it in, in some an influencer's video or, or hearing about it, you talking about it on a podcast or what have you, because I'm like, but that was started off with just like a, a sketch or a note. And now like you're seeing it, you walk into a store and I could show my kids. I'm mean, like, yeah, that those products right there, like we, we make them. And that was cool. And actually one time we were in Hawaii on a vacation and I saw a garden center. I was like, uh, and the kids were young. I'm like, we have to stop. And, and they, they had our product because I didn't even think we were distributed in Hawaii. So I was pleasantly surprised. And like, we were taking pictures with my kids and the managers and the thing. like, it was just like, like, it sounds silly, but so yeah, just, you know, launching new product lines, seeing things go from concept. I think there's a satisfaction in making things, you know, so sometimes that may be new buildings, new equipment too, just seeing that kind of stuff, building this new processing plant, hiring new employees, you know, seeing the company grow, the people grow. It's a really cool you know, feeling. So there's not like one specific thing that I can really go, oh, like that was definitely the the best day or, or something like that. I've been proud of, of a lot of things over, you know, 26 years. Again, kind of how our eyes pointed towards the fifth generation. My, my kids are 20 and 22, so they're not that far away. And, and uh, you know, we've kind of followed the same tradition of kind of keeping them away. But see what happens if they if they want to join and, and keep going, you know, from there. And obviously to help having a much younger sister and brother in law, you know, to help bridge the bridge that gap and go. So yeah, no, it's been a it's been a fun ride. Yeah, I feel like I see a little bit of a parallel between Herb and Dean and the two of you where Herb came up with the idea 
got it going, and then Dean kind of scaled it. Then Surge took over, like established it in this new kind of national company. And now you, Jeremy, with the implementation of this new plant, like, and the potential that you were talking about moving into golf courses, moving into all of these different things. Like, it's a kind of cool parallel I'm seeing between the two father-son sets in this, you know, four generation span. Well, just for the record, I made it national, not him. But, oh, you uh... made it national. Okay. <laughs> oh, you could have thrown him a bone, Jeremy. <laughs> he, he automated and all that. Yeah, yeah. automated. Yes. No, I think, look, a lot of family businesses, you know, you hear a lot of a lot of uh, nightmares and, and things that, that sometimes happen. I think, you know, we've been fortunate. My dad and Dean worked really well together. My dad and I worked really together, worked really well together. He was always very operationally focused. I was more sales and marketing focused. We complemented each other very well. And so, uh, you know, we've been fortunate that we've made good teams. We've had easy, relatively easy transitions and we're experienced at it. So uh, hopefully it, it continues to go on, you know, on from there. I love that. Jamie, we didn't talk about social media before I ask you this final question. I have to ask you a little bit about, you know, what you said that you've recently come on, not recently, but you know, over the eight years you've been at Espoma, you're dealing with this brand and social media in a capacity that previous generations haven't had to deal with. Your dad has, you know, mentioned multiple times, this was before internet, this was before. Now you're dealing with plant fluencers, you're dealing with, you know, not just radio hosts, but podcasters, you're dealing with a whole new crop of media platforms that you need to make the shoe polish for the sexy shoes for. So can you speak a little bit just to like how the brand has evolved on social media, like kind of over the generations, like how how you're trying to show up for the consumer through these platforms? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously it's easy when you have a product that works and and I guess I'll give my, for my, my brother, the bone of saying that he is right a lot of the times that doesn't matter what we do and how we say it, as long as the product's good and it works, that's the core. Because if you buy something just because somebody's marketed it really well and then it you know fails you, you're never going to buy it again. So we had this established brand, we have these established products and you know real professional gardeners, real hobby gardeners, garden clubs, you know landscapers, garden centers all these educated people already know us, promote us, love us. Well, you know, you try things, right? When you, you start your house plants, you start with something, you try it, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, then you get vested and then you're trying other things. So people eventually find us. And that's probably true whether or not we had, you know, gone into social media or how we market or how much advertising we did. And if you go back before social, you know, the radio hosts and the, all the other advertising efforts that we, we had done, um, people would find us because we're the products that would end up working and we're meeting our consumers where they are, right? They're on social media. They have questions. They want to share their plants. They want to share how they're using our products. You know, we always do things when things, you know, come, technologies come about. We're okay. Let's get on Facebook. Okay. Let's do these things. But now we've kind of, we've changed things in the sense that you could always call the company and ask a question, but now you can start to meet us as a brand there's a lot of companies that have these taglines and stuff. And I think Jeremy and I have been talking recently, like we don't have like one tagline. We've had some advertising taglines, but it's not just like one thing that we always say about the company, but there's companies, I'm not going to name them, but they're, you know, America's organic gardening company, America's this, the brand gardeners trust, the, the gardeners resource. And I'm like, we're all those things. And we've been all those things. And, um, you know, it's time to kind of toot the horn a little bit and, show people that we've been around 95 years and none of these other companies have. You're not America's gardening company if you're younger than me. That's just a fact. Like we're the America's organic gardening company and we don't pay people to tout our products. You know, like we work with people like just how we kind of found you. I mean, you were using our products. We're not looking for people to force them to change of like, here, you should try it you're not using us, we're not working with you. So I think everything about us goes back to authenticity and probably back to what you were saying, you know, integrity. And, and again, like it works. We're just reminding people in different avenues now. Yeah. 
I'll always remember, well, two quick stories that your story just reminded me of. Yeah, I found you because Summer Rain Oaks had a plant swap that you guys gave the bottles of indoor out. I was like, what is this? I'd never tried it. I had a horrible experience trying to fertilize my plants with blue crystal synthetic fertilizer. Got all over my kitchen. It was a mess because you have to mix it up. I tried your product and I was like, who are these people? And I don't remember if you reached out. I think I reached out to you, but being like, you reached out to me. But I had already been using, yeah, I had already been using you guys. And then the other thing I just wanted to say, you just reminded me of, you know, that you've been around for so long. A couple of years ago, I ended up gardening with my best plant friend, Melody, who was 75 years old. She had a garden. She lived down the street from me. I ended up doing my whole garden with her over that summer. And I remember being like, oh, we've got to like stock, you know, if I'm in a garden with Melody and shoot content in her garden, we got to get a Spoma products there. She took me into her shed and it was filled with Espoma products. And I was like, oh my gosh, Espoma, you know them? And she was like, oh yeah, I've been using them for decades. Like she's she had been a, a gardener for decades upon decades. And she, I think, started mentioning with Holly Tone and then kind of explained the, you know, she was a big garden tone person. But I do think that the brand like speaks across generations. And that was just a fun bonding moment for me and Melody that we were like, you like Espoma? I like Espoma, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so then Jamie you kind of spoke to, you know, what you're looking to build in social media, but what's your favorite part of working with your brother and your dad? What's the favorite part of the family business for you? It sounds cheesy in some ways. Like it is nice to work with family. I also work with my husband. Yeah. Matt didn't join us today, but shout out to Matt, your other half. Yeah. I joined the company later on and I didn't actually go to my dad and say, Oh, I think I'm interested. I actually think at one point in my life, and this is why you should never say things out loud in your early 20s, I was like, I would never work for our family business. I'm like, here I am. But, um, you know, to me, one thing about a family business, whether I worked here or not, I think growing up, and I would have to say, maybe to some degree, this is probably true for Jeremy, you you hear about businesses and you hear about other, you know, friends parents, family businesses, or just in your life, you see people do certain things. Maybe you work for an employer that you just, you get those impressions that they're cutting corners. They're not always doing things the right way. I mean, I I worked for somebody, but in a different industry that I would listen almost to her door because I wanted to see the lies that she was kind of spewing so that I could know how I needed to navigate. And that wasn't a fun way to really like spend my days. Like I didn't feel invested in somebody that was just willing to kind of be that type of person. So I think the one thing I always felt proud of my dad and Jeremy and and our business, like there are no skeletons in the closet. Like there's nothing like, you you know, you're not going to find out that like we did something the wrong way or that we've hurt your plant or we've hurt the environment or that we've treated our employees wrong or that, you know, we did these shady business, any little thing. It's like, I would hear these things and I'm like, I would always in the back of my mind be like, I'm just glad I don't have to worry about that. I think that to me is something, whether, whether or not like as a family, we agree or whether or not everything is always perfect in our business or whether or not, you know, everything is, is great. Like it's nice to, to just be able to sit back and know that you don't have to worry about that. That's the weight off your shoulders that maybe you don't have if you work elsewhere, you know, like, or for, you know, not for your family where you have that knowledge and safety. Yeah, I think integrity is such a through line in this conversation. And also, I'll just say, as a content creator, I work with tons of partners, right? I work with tons of sponsors. And I feel like you guys that trickles through to your your relationships with with your media partners. I mean, I'll never forget the day I was on the phone with you it you know almost in tears or i think i had had a mental breakdown the the night previous about the fact that my lime tree was dying and i needed to bring my lime tree to florida and jamie was like what do you need like we'll get the tree a, an airline ticket if it needs like how can we support you i think it started as a joke and then we were like this would be a great story <laughs> and then it was like a joke that got out of hand yeah you were like but that would make a great piece of video content But, you know, like you guys helped me execute flying, you know, Limey down. And that happened almost two years ago. And I still have listeners ask me about how Limey is doing in Florida, like on a weekly basis. So and I also just another thing about Espoma is it's from the get go from the 20s, you guys were always focused on the hobbyist. You were always focused on the 
person taking care of their lawn, not growing stuff at a large scale. And I think that's, you know, who our audience is. So on behalf of the audience, but also me, thank you guys for being such wonderful partners of the show for so many years. Thank you for building such amazing, you know, making such amazing products. Where can everyone go check out all of the the insane line of tones that you have? You have a tone for everything. But uh, where can people learn more about all the different products that you guys have to offer if they are so inspired after listening to this episode? Well, I'm going I'm to take that as the marketing person. So obviously you go to our website, espoma.com, but you know, you're going to find us on all the social media, you know, Instagram, we're on TikTok now, Facebook, you can find out everything. You go to our products and you're going to find, you know, what can you use it on and how to, how to apply it, everything you need to know. If you're a reading person, you can obviously read the blogs. If you're somebody that's visual, there's the videos right there. So there's no lack of it. And, you know, we always say, go to your local garden center. If you have one, you know, those people are trusted resources. Ask for Espoma products. They'll help guide you to the right color in the rainbow. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for being with me today. And uh, yeah, let's keep growing some exciting other products. Can't wait to see what's in store after this uh, facility opens up. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. so much to Espoma. This was so fun getting to know them. I hope you loved this multi-generational interview. So rare that you get to speak to so many members of a family-run business. Special thanks to Espoma. Like I said, they have one of the first people to believe in me. They were one of the first sponsors of the show. They have definitely been more of a partner than a sponsor. I've really loved working with them. I love this company. I love their products. You can definitely go to Espoma.com to check out what products they have that are perfect for your indoor and outdoor gardens. And you can check my Amazon storefront for a list of curated products that I love personally. And you know, like I said, I've kind of stumbled upon this mini series of profiling plant entrepreneurs, planty entrepreneurs. So lately, we've had, you know, Mariah Green talking about plant styling, Soltech talking about grow lights, Espoma. Today, we had that amazing episode on the nine different ways that you can get into the horticulture industry. If these types of episodes inspire you. If you like them, please let me know. I will make more of them. Because Plant Friend, I'm here to help you keep growing joy. Plant Friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast.